The Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 57 Meanwhile, Angel Clare had walked automatically along the way by which he had come, and, entering his hotel, sat down over the breakfast, staring at nothingness. He went on eating and drinking unconsciously, till, on a sudden, he demanded his bill, having paid which he took his dressing-bag in his hand, the only luggage he had brought with him, and went out. At the moment of his departure a telegram was handed to him, a few words from his mother, stating that they were glad to know his address, and informing that his brother Cuthbert had proposed to and been accepted by Mercy Chant. Clare crumpled up the paper and followed the route to the station. Reaching it he found that there would be no train leaving for an hour or more. He sat down to wait, and having waited a quarter of an hour felt that he could wait there no longer. Broken in heart and numbed, he had nothing to hurry for, but he wished to get out of a town which had been the scene of such inexperience, and turned to walk towards the first station onward, and let the train pick him up there. The highway that he followed was open, and, at a little distance, dipped into a valley across which it could be seen running from edge to edge. He had traversed the greater part of this depression, and was climbing the western acclivity, when, pausing for breath, he unconsciously looked back. Why he did so he could not say, but something seemed to impel him to the act. The tape-like surface of the road diminished in his rear as far as he could see, and as he gazed a moving spot intruding on the white vacuity of its perspective. It was a human figure, running. Clare waited with a dim sense that somebody was trying to overtake him. The form descending the incline was a woman's. Yet so entirely was his mind blinded to the idea of his wife's following him, that even when she came nearer he did not recognize her under the totally changed attire in which he now beheld her. It was not till she was quite close that he could believe her to be Tess. "'I saw you turn away from the station, just before I got there, and I have been following you all this way.' She was so pale, so breathless, so quivering in every muscle, that he did not ask her a single question, but, seizing her hand and pulling it within his arm, he led her along. To avoid meeting any possible wayfarers, he left the high road and took a footpath under some fir-trees. When they were deep among the moaning boughs, he stopped and looked at her inquiringly. Angel, she said, as if waiting for this, do you know what I have been running after you for? To tell you that I have killed him. A pitiful white smile lit her face as she spoke. What? said he, thinking from the strangeness of her manner that she was in some delirium. I have done it. I don't know how, she continued. Still, I owed it to you and to myself, Angel. I feared long ago when I struck him in the mouth with my glove that I might do it some day for the trap he set for me in my simple youth, and his wrong to you through me. He has come between us and ruined us, and now he can never do it any more. I never loved him at all, Angel, as I loved you. You know it, don't you? You believe it? You didn't come back to me, and I was obliged to go back to him. Why did you go away? Why did you, when I love you so much? I can't think why you did it, but I don't blame you. Only, Angel, will you forgive me my sin against you, now that I have killed him? I thought, as I ran along, that you would be sure to forgive me now I have done that. It came to me as a shining light that I should get you back that way. I could not bear the loss of you any longer. You don't know how entirely I was unable to bear your not loving me. Say you do now, dear, dear husband, 
Say you do. Now I have killed him." "'I do love you, Tess. Oh, I do. It is all come back,' he said, tightening his arms round her with fervid pressure. "'But how do you mean you have killed him?' "'I mean that I have,' she murmured in a reverie. "'What? Bodily? Is he dead?' "'Yes. He heard me crying about you, and he bitterly taunted me, and called you by a foul name. And then I did it. My heart could not bear it. He had nagged me about you before. And then I dressed myself, and came away to find you." By degrees he was inclined to believe that she had faintly attempted, at least, what she said she had done and his horror at her impulse was mixed with amazement at the strength of her affection for him, and at the strangeness of its quality, which had apparently extinguished her moral sense altogether. Unable to realise the gravity of her conduct, she seemed at last content, and he looked at her as she lay upon his shoulder, weeping with happiness, and wondered what obscure strain in the d'Urberville blood had led to this aberration, if it were an aberration. There momentarily flashed through his mind that the family tradition of the coach and murder might have arisen because the d'Urbervilles had been known to do these things. As well as his confused and excited ideas could reason, he supposed that, in the moment of mad grief of which she spoke, her mind had lost its balance, and plunged her into this abyss. It was very terrible, if true, if a temporary hallucination, sad. But anyhow, here was this deserted wife of his, this passionately fond woman, clinging to him without a suspicion that he would be anything to her but a protector. He saw that for him to be otherwise was not, in her mind, within the region of the possible. Tenderness was absolutely dominant in Clare at last. He kissed her endlessly with his white lips, and held her hand, and said, I will not desert you, I will protect you by every means in my power, dearest love, whatever you may have done, or not have done. Then they walked on under the trees, Tess turning her head every now and then to look at him. Worn and unhandsome as he had become, it was plain that she did not discern the least fault in his appearance. To her he was, as of old, all that was perfection, personally and mentally. He was her Antinous, her Apollo even. His sickly face was beautiful as the morning, to her affectionate regard, on this day no less than when she had first beheld him. For was it not the face of the one man on earth who had loved her purely, and who had believed in her as pure. With an instinct as to possibilities, he did not now, as he had intended, make for the first station beyond the town, but plunged still farther under the firs, which here abounded for miles. Each clasping the other round the waist, they promenaded under the dry beds of fir-needles, thrown into a vague, intoxicating atmosphere at the consciousness of being together at last, with no living soul between them, ignoring that there was a corpse. Thus they proceeded for several miles till Tess, arousing herself, looked about her, and said timidly, "'Are we going anywhere in particular?' "'I don't know, dearest. Why?' "'I don't know. Well, we might walk a few miles further, and when it is evening find lodging somewhere or other, in a lonely cottage, perhaps. Can you walk well, Tessie?" "'Oh, yes, I could walk for ever and ever, with your arm round me.' Upon the whole it seemed a good thing to do, whereupon they quickened their pace, avoiding high roads and following obscure paths, tending more or less northward. But there was an unpractical vagueness in their movements throughout the day. Neither one of them seemed to consider any question of effectual escape, disguise, or long concealment. Their every idea was temporary, 
and unfulfending, like the plans of two children. At midday they drew near to a roadside inn, and Tess would have entered it with him to get something to eat, but he persuaded her to remain among the trees and bushes of this half-woodland, half-moorland part of the country, till he should come back. Her clothes were of recent fashion. Even the ivory-handled parasol that she carried was of a shape unknown in the retired spot to which they had now wandered, and the cut of such articles would have attracted attention in the settle of a tavern. He soon returned, with food enough for half a dozen people, and two bottles of wine, enough to last them for a day or more, should any emergency arise. They sat down upon some dead boughs, and shared their meal. Between one and two o'clock they packed up the remainder, and went on again. "'I feel strong enough to walk any distance,' said she. "'I think we may as well steer in a general way towards the interior of the country, where we can hide for a while, and are less likely to be looked for than anywhere near the coast,' Clare remarked. "'Later on, when they have forgotten us, we can make for some port.' She made no reply to this beyond that of grasping him more tightly, and straight inland they went. Though the season was an English May, the weather was serenely bright, and during the afternoon it was quite warm. Through the latter miles of their walk their footpath had taken them into the depths of the new forest, and towards evening, turning the corner of a lane, they perceived behind a brook and a bridge a large board on which was painted in white letters, This desirable mansion to be let furnished, particulars following, with directions to apply to some London agents. Passing through the gate they could see the house, an old brick building of regular design and large accommodation. "'I know it,' said Clare. "'It's Bramhurst Court. You can see that it's shut up, and grass is growing on the drive.' Some of the windows are open," said Tess, just to air the rooms, I suppose. All these rooms empty, and we without a roof to our heads. You are getting tired, my Tess, he said. We'll stop soon, and kissing her sad mouth, he again led her onwards. He was growing weary likewise, for they had wandered a dozen or fifteen miles and it became necessary to consider what they should do for rest. They looked from afar at isolated cottages and little inns, and were inclined to approach one of the latter, when their hearts failed them, and they sheared off. At length their gait dragged, and they stood still. "'Could we sleep under the trees?' she asked. He thought the season insufficiently advanced. "'I have been thinking of that empty mansion we passed," he said. Let us go back towards it again. They retraced their steps, but it was half an hour before they stood without the entry gate as earlier. He then requested her to stay where she was, whilst he went to see who was within. She sat down among the bushes within the gate, and Clare crept towards the house. His absence lasted for some considerable time and when he returned Tess was wildly anxious, not for herself, but for him. He found out from a boy that there was only an old woman in charge as caretaker, and that she only came there on fine days, from the hamlet near, to open and shut the windows. She would come to shut them at sunset. "'Now we can get in through one of the lower windows and rest there,' said he. Under his escort she went tardily forward to the main front, whose shuttered windows, like sightless eyeballs, excluded the possibility of watchers. The door was reached a few steps further, and one of the windows beside it was open. Clare clambered in, and pulled Tess in after him. Except the hall the rooms were all in darkness, and they ascended the staircase. Up here also the shutters were tightly closed the ventilation being perfunctorily done, for this day at least, by opening the hall window in front and an upper window behind. Clare unlatched the door of a large chamber, felt his way across it, and parted the shutters to the width of two or three inches. 
a shaft of dazzling sunlight glanced into the room, revealing heavy, old-fashioned furniture, crimson damask hangings, and an enormous four-post bedstead, along the head of which were carved running figures, apparently Atalanta's race. "'Rest at last,' said he, setting down his bag and the parcel of viands. They remained in great quietness till the caretaker should have come to shut the windows, as a precaution putting themselves in total darkness by barring the shutters as before, lest the woman should open the door of their chamber for any casual reason. Between six and seven o'clock she came, but did not approach the wing they were in. She heard her close the windows, fasten them, lock the door, and go away. Then Clare again stole a chink of light from the window, and they shared another meal, till by and by they were enveloped in the shades of night which they had no candle to disperse. End of chapter 57